All right, good morning and Merry Christmas. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas around here, isn't it? All right, just a quick poll. How many of you have your tree up? Anyone here say not yet? All right. Any, anybody do, that does it like Christmas Eve, like right around Christmas? Okay, so it's not that. It's just, it's busy, right? Things are crazy. How many of you have all of your Christmas shopping done? How many, have not wow. How many of you have not started on your Christmas shopping? Yeah. <laughs> I got a wife back here pointing at her husband. That means you haven't shopped for her. So you better get on that, right? Yeah, not a big shocker. All right. Let me ask you an important question. And around this season, really any season, it's an important question. What do you worry about? I can put it another way. What are you worried about? What are the things in your life or the people that you know, what are we worrying about in our culture in our day and age? Your kids? Okay, what about your kids? Yeah, that they be safe. Good. What else? What else do we worry about? Oh, disappointment from parents. That, that, was, that, that was like deep, serious right there. That's good. Well, I heard something back here. Oh, school? Yeah, that's a tough one. What else? We haven't hit the big one. Ah, oh, see, you all knew. You just don't, it's too obvious, right? We worry about money. In fact, I, I looked up Psychology Today has done multiple studies, and they, they do this same study like every decade, and the answers may have changed order, but the top four things that we worry about have, have not changed since they began doing this study. Number one is money or our future. Number two is our job security. We worry whether we're going to have a job come tomorrow. Number three is relationships. And these are kind of big topics. And some of the things you've talked about fall under that. We worry about, uh, are, am I disappointing my parents? Are my kids safe? And the fourth thing is we worry about our health and the health of the people that we love. Here's kind of the thing. Anyone in this room not worry about anything? All right. We all worry at some point in our lives. We've worried about something in our culture. Worry seems to be our default state, doesn't it? When something bad happens, what do we do? We worry about it. We get really stressed about it. And around this time, around Christmas time, worry can amp up for all kinds of, for all of these reasons. Our, our money it seems to be going out the door quick. And we talked about that last week, right? The average American will spend $1,000 this year on Christmas. $720 billion spent this year. Uh, that can be stressful. Now, we know we're going to get good gifts, but there's still a lot to worry. There's a lot to worry about in the world, isn't there? I mean, you look outside your door, you turn on the TV, there is a lot to be worried about. It's our, it, it's, it's our natural state. It's kind of second nature for us. And worry, when you define worry, you think about what worry really means. Worry is this idea of being unsure of the outcome, whether it's a specific situation I'm not sure how this, this situation is going to work itself out, so I, I worry about it. Anyone, by the way, ever think about a situation and you, you think and you actually have a conversation or you run a situation over and over and over and over in your head? And it just keeps, anyone ever been kept up at night? Or wake up early in the morning with that? You got, you're running through and you know how it's going to go and it never goes that way. But you've run through all thousand permutations of the situation, and it never goes in any one of those ways. But we're worried about it because we're unsure of how that situation is going to work out. We also worry about our own lives because we're unsure how things are going to work out. We worry about our kids. Why? Because we love them. We love them, and we're unsure how things are going to work out for them. Anyone here have a grand plan for your kids? Those of you who have adult kids, did you have a grand plan for your kids when they were growing up? Did they follow that grand plan? No, if they would just follow it, we wouldn't have to worry, right? But they like are human beings and get to make their own choices and learn their own lessons. We lo I would love if my children would learn lessons from me or learn the lessons that I already learned. But you know who else wishes that? My mother. <laughs> wishes that I would have done that very same thing. That's not how it works. So we worry. Well, the opposite of worry is our topic this morning. And as we're going through Advent, we've talked about, last week we talked about the gift of hope, right? 
And we've got gifts here on stage. Now, they're not wrapped, but if you had, if they were wrapped, and I talked last week, I had the gift sitting right here. And it'd be great if I had it now, but I didn't think that far ahead. If I had this gift, and I said we had this gift of hope, and it's that feeling we have right before you open the gift. Remember? You remember what that feeling is? That excitement that there's something good inside the gift? That's hope. And that's the gift that God gives us during this season and during all seasons of our life. It's this idea that God is good, and because he's good, he always gives us good things. So the gift that God has given us is this idea that everything in our life is going to work out because God is good, and he gives us good things. So, and it's the gift that keeps on giving. When you open the gift of hope, what's inside the gift? More hope. And you just keep going. So we talked about hope, but this morning we're talking about peace. And peace is the absence of worry. So I think I missed hope and now peace. Peace is the absence of worry. And we are desperate for peace, aren't we? I mean, this whole season, right? The angels came, and what did they declare on, on that Christmas morning to the shepherds? Peace on earth. And we have been searching. For, I mean, if you ever watch a beauty pageant, and you say, what's the one thing you'd like to do in this world? What do, we, what do they say? What's the answer? World peace. We want peace not just in the world. We want peace in us. We want inner peace. And we will search for it every... I mean, there are people doing yoga and doing meditation. They're making themselves look like idiots. <laughs> They're doing yoga and meditation. And by the way, anyone ever tried to meditate here? It's hard. Because it's just you and your brain, right? And we're trying... And the whole idea of meditation is to empty our minds of everything. Just get rid of all of that stuff, right? That's the goal. Does it work? It's like, no, in fact, any time, by the way, you go, go to look at the world, go to the world to try and find any of these gifts that we're talking about during Advent, you go to the world to find a hope, you're going to be sadly disappointed. You go to the world to find peace. At best, the world offers a partial peace. At worst, it's fake. It's just not real. It's the feeling of peace for a for a moment. See, we talk a great game when it comes to peace, but here's the thing. How many would, you, would like to have peace? Inner peace. How many would like to have inner peace? How many of you would like to have world peace? Oh, yes. Yeah, we talk a great game, but wanting it and achieving it are two completely different things, aren't they? They're completely different things, but we want it. So here's the question. And we, we talk about Advent and we lit this candle of peace. I have the same question for us this morning as I had last Sunday. How do we get this kind of peace? By the way, does God promise us peace? Yes. Yes. In fact, biblically, peace is is right here in Scripture. It is a gift, very much like hope. It is a gift given to us by God, but the gift is a little bit different. So I want you to grab your Bibles and turn to John chapter 14. And we're going to stay right around John chapter 14 for a little bit. John 14, verse 27. Now, these are red letters, so what does that tell you? Jesus is speaking. This is part of a longer narrative. And he's he's talking to his disciples. He's actually told... uh, Peter, that he is going to deny him. This is the last real conversation, the deep conversation Jesus has with his disciples. He tells them that he is the only way to the Father. Here he is promising them the Holy Spirit. Verse 27, he says, I am leaving you with a gift. I'm leaving you with a gift, Jesus says. And that gift is peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Who is giving us this gift of peace? Jesus. He says, I'm leaving, and I'm leaving you with this gift, 
peace. Now, what kind of peace? Is he saying, I'm going to leave you with world peace? No, what's he say? Peace of mind and heart. In our terminology this morning, he's leaving us with inner peace. Peace in our mind and peace in our, the, our peace in your mind. That's the, you're not staying up till two o'clock in the morning or waking up at four o'clock in the morning, running through a scenario over and over again because you're unsure of how it's going to work out. He says, I will relieve you of all of that stuff going on in your mind. Wouldn't that be awesome? How about peace of heart? That's deep inside of us. It's not just what we're thinking about. It's who we are at our core being. Can you have peace in your heart and in your mind? Jesus says you can. It's the gift that he's given to us. In fact, if you turn over just a couple more chapters, he kind of begins to tell us how that happens. And I want to tell you, this is not a gift. Much like hope, this is not a gift that is given... The, the result of peace is not that God solves all your problems, which is one way you could have all the stuff in your mind and heart go away, right? If God solved every problem you ever had, would you ever have to worry about anything? No. But I, I want you to tell you, that's not what we're talking about. And Jesus clarifies that here in, in chapter th or verse 33 of, of chapter 16. Again, this is a, in that same conversation. He says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Oh, yay. <laughs> Jesus says, I'm going to leave you with peace, and you can, I'm telling you all of this so that you can have peace in me, so that you don't have to be troubled or afraid, but then he follows that up by saying, what? You're going to have trouble. You're going to have trials. You're going to have sorrows, but take heart. Because why? I have overcome the world. See, worry is this idea that we're not sure how things are going to work out. And Jesus comes and says, you can have peace of mind and heart because I'm telling you, I've overcome everything already. What is Jesus really saying? What are you worried about? What are you worried about? When we come to God with our worries, that's got to be the first thing on his mind. What are you worried about? Why would God say that? I've already taken care of it. And we talked about this last week. I'm a good God, and I give you good things. We sing about how much he loves and cares for us. And so when the situation comes, we immediately, I mean, the first thing in our mind is, I don't need to worry about this because God's got it under control, and he loves me, and he cares for me. That's not how it works, right? That's not how it works in my brain. I hope it works that way in your brain. And that's kind of how what Jesus is telling us that we need to do. How can we have this kind of hope? Because the outcome is already sure. Now, are we going to have trials? Yes. But do we know the outcome of that? Is it good or bad? It's good. Are we going to have sorrow in this world? Yes. But who ultimately wins? How many of you have ever, how many of you like mystery books or suspense movies? Don't you hate it when somebody spoils it? I was talking to someone the other day who has not watched The Sixth Sense. You remember when that movie came out? That was like the best, and if I'm spoiling it, that movie is too old, okay? The time has come. I'm going to spoil it for you. Right? The end, I'm not actually, but the end of that movie, nobody told anybody. Why? Because, so right? oh, that, that was the whole point of the movie, right? We don't want someone to spoil it. Except I'm going to spoil something for you this morning. I'm going to tell you how this story ends. I'm going to tell you how your story ends. God wins. In fact, I even say that future tense, it's not future tense. God won. It's over. The battle is over. Now the enemy is going out kicking and screaming. But when you're on God's side, you are on the winning side. It's not a question of, are we going to win this game? Are we going to win this battle? We've won. So it begs the big question. What are you worried about? We know how this movie ends. 
We know how this story ends, don't we? In fact, we can read specifically how it ends. You don't believe me? Go read Revelation. It'll tell you. God wins and we get to get to be in heaven where there is no more crying, there are no more tears, there is no more pain, there is no more anger, there is no more worrying about health or worrying about your kids because we will be with God for all of eternity and he'll get rid of all sin and all sorrow and all shame. That's what we have to look for. That's our hope. And because we have that hope, we can have peace. But that begs a question. We know all of that. I know, I know how the story ends. I've read it at least one time. I've talked about it a few times. And yet, this morning, it's almost shameful. This morning, I was woken up early thinking about a situation, worrying about it. And the sermon was done. I knew what I was going to stand up here and say. I knew what I was going to tell you. Now, here, here's the, oh, pastor, uh, we'll pray for you. <laughs> here's what else I know. When we're done here this morning, you will have heard this truth and you will believe this truth and you'll still walk out these doors and some of you are going to worry about stuff. You may be worrying about stuff while I'm speaking right now. <laughs> Even though, and you're saying, amen. That's right, brother, preach it. And you're nudging your partner or some stranger sitting next to you going, oh, you better listen to this. <laughs> Not because what I'm saying is true. This is what God said. You and I can have peace. Yet it is still elusive, isn't it? Yep. Right. We're promised it, but it's still elusive. So how do we get it? And what's the problem? Is it a gift from God? Yes. 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 But I'm here to tell you it is a different kind of gift than hope. Some gifts you open and you just take them out of the box and they're ready to roll, right? Here's a gift right here. Is this thing ready to go? How many of you fathers have ever purchased one just like this? If you're cheap, how do you actually get this thing? In a box. With thousands of pieces, right? And you're going to stay up all night because, you know, it's a kid's birthday or... You know, Christmas is coming and it's what you're giving to your child. Santa delivers them pre-assembled. Mom and dad, not so much, right? You got to spend time. I talked last year, I talked about this, this idea that, that and I think I talked about this very same thing. Well, that means we need a reminder. Peace is some assembly required. It doesn't come pre-assembled. Hope comes pre-assembled, right? You open the gift and what do you got? Hope. Peace takes some effort to put it together. Anyone ever put, gotten a thousand piece puzzle? That's a weird gift to me, by the way. Here's the gift. You put it together, right? Anyone ever bought furniture at Ikea? Yeah, we're going to come back to that here in a second. Anyone ever gotten, received a gift that required assembly? Yeah, the one I talked about was an RC car last, last year is what I talked about. My, my parents got my brother an RC car and it was in like a billion pieces and they had to put it together. Well, knowing that we have peace is like opening this gift of peace and all the pieces are spread out on the floor and we're going, how come I don't have it? What do we have to do? We have to start to put it together, which begs an important question. How do we put it together? Yeah, what are the parts and how do I, how do I put it together? Just like, like the, the Ikea furniture, the thousand piece puzzle. And that's why the piece we sometimes have is incomplete. And why we keep coming back to it. Because we pick up a piece of the puzzle and we put it on, but is the puzzle complete? No, we got to finish that picture. Finish what it looks like and finish assembling it. Here's the good news. If you received this, or you received, you got an Ikea, or you got the, well, not the puzzle. Well, yeah, kind of the puzzle. You receive a gift that requires some assembly. What do you need to do to put it together? Now, men, this is hard for us to admit. You read, you follow the instructions. And so in order for us to put the gift of peace together, not only do we need to follow instructions, we need to follow whose instructions? God's instructions. And where do we find God's instructions? Right here. It's in your hand, either paper or electronic. Here's what I'm going to promise you. 
they do not look like this. God's instructions don't look like... This is literally Ikea instructions for some piece of furniture. That's all you get. Just put it together. I mean, at least there's numbers, right? How many of you have ever put together a piece of Ikea furniture? What do you always have? You have extra parts. And they don't tell you, am I supposed to have those extra parts or not? I'm always scared of Ikea furniture because I don't know if someone left off an important piece or not. Like that critical piece that's going to keep it all together, that one thing. Here's my promise to you. God's instructions do not look like that. They are far simpler. Now, did you hear the word I said? Simple, not easy. The instructions are simple. In fact, there's just two of them. But they're not easy things to do. If they were easy, we would have done them. So grab your Bibles. We're going to go to two passages that give us the instructions we need. Now, I've listed them, Philippians, Isaiah, but we're going to go Isaiah and then Philippians. I don't know why I did it that way. Isaiah chapter 26. By the way, Isaiah is about right there. It's about right in the middle of your Bible. Isaiah 26, and we're going to read verse 3. You will keep, who's the you? God. This is a song to God. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you and all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Two things. We just read them. What are they? Trust, trust. trust in Him and fix your thoughts on Him. Trust and fix. Put those two words in your head, okay? This is from the Old Testament, Isaiah. And we've read Isaiah twice during this Advent. Isaiah says, he, God will keep you in perfect peace if you what? Trust in Him, trust in him and fix your thoughts. All right, so keep that thought and now turn to Philippians chapter 4. By the way, this section of Philippians is one of my favorite in Scripture. It's something I need to be reminded of often. I put verse 7 there, but I want to come back to verse 6. That's a typo. It says, don't worry. Don't what? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your, listen to this again, your hearts and your minds. There it is. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Now we are promised peace, yes? But is it just a blank check? No, even here. He says, don't worry. But instead of worrying, what are we supposed to do? Pray about everything with thanksgiving and tell God what you need. And thank Him for everything that He's already done and that He's going to do. Because you can trust God. What is the first step in having God's peace? Trust. Don't worry. Instead of worrying, trust God. Which, by the way, should be the attitude we have when we come to Him in prayer. Prayer is not a fix-all for everything going on in your life. Prayer is a, God, here's what's going on, and I trust that you're going to work in this situation. Does God very often work the way I want him to work? No. But he always works the way I need him to work. And I trust that. So I don't need to worry. And if I do worry, I'm supposed to go to him and tell him what I'm... 
Which means at two in the morning, when you're running through a scenario, what had, should you be doing instead? Praying. So I'm going to ruin some of your lives right now. Because I want this stuff to be practical. Not just theory. It's easy for me to stand here and say, don't worry. There's a song written about it. Don't worry. Be happy. That song came out in the 80s. How's it working? Because that's theory. In theory, we don't worry. What's the practical side of that? Don't worry. Instead, pray. So at two in the morning, when you're running through these scenarios, what should you be doing? What will you do now? Pray. And the first thing we should tell God is, I'm worried. I'm worried. And I know I shouldn't be. And I trust you. Say those words to God. I trust you. And by the way, speaking out loud in prayer is powerful. Speaking out, but my spouse will be right next to me. Then say it really loud. (laughs) Or go somewhere else in the house. But say out loud, God, I'm worried right now, but I trust you. And I'm giving this to you. And I am so thankful. You see how the conversation is different now? Instead of me thinking through this and I say, God, I've been thinking through all of these scenarios. But the truth is, I have no idea how this is going to come out. I have no idea how this is going to work out. But I trust that how it's going to work out is exactly how you want it to work out. I trust you. Now, will that be the last prayer you have to pray on it? Probably not. In fact, if you lay down and you start worrying about it again, what had you better do? Get back up and start praying again. God, I thought I'd given it, but I'm still worried. As long as you're worrying, you should be praying. As long as you're worrying, you should be praying. Until you trust him and he releases you of it. And it says if you do that, he will give you his peace to guard your heart and your mind. That's his promise. That's not on you, that's on him. What's on us, pulling the pieces together is saying, God, I'm coming to you in prayer and I'm giving you my worry, but I'm trusting in you. And I'm going to say it. All right, that was the first part. Did you catch the second part of what we're supposed to do? Fix your thoughts. Focus on the good. Focus, and who is the good, by the way? God is the good. Isaiah says, I will keep you in perfect peace, those who trust in me and whose Fix their thoughts on me. And then here in Philippians, Paul says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable, things that are excellent and worthy of praise. That All of that stuff points one direction. Points to God. So here's the problem we have. And we had this problem with hope. When we're worried and thinking about a problem, we're thinking about the problem and not the solution. Right? Oh no, yeah I am, Pastor. I'm thinking about all the ways I'm going to fix the problem. That assumes you're the solution. And if you were the solution, you wouldn't be in that problem in the first place. Who's the solution? God is. So we fix our thoughts on Him and not the problem. How do I stop worrying? I tell God I'm worrying and I fix my thoughts on him, the one who's going to solve the problem in the first place. But again, that's great theory unless we walk out of here and do those things. So what's my big challenge to you? Don't worry. It's not don't worry, be happy. It's don't worry, trust God and focus on him. Think about him. Instead of the problem, think about the solution. Now, I'm, I'm just being real honest. I'm working on it. How about you? I mean, I told you I'm working on it this morning. But you know what I did this morning? Different than I did the morning before that or a week ago? I prayed. And I said, God, actually, right, it came back again. So right here, I knelt down on that, at that chair and I said, God, I'm, I'm worried again. It's still going through my head. And I'm about to stand up and talk about this. And I think, I, I didn't really hear this, but I think back in mind, I'm like, God's like, yeah, I know. Because you're working on it. 
And are we going to get this perfect every time? No, the point is not to get it perfectly every time. The point is that when it comes up, because we will have trials and sorrows and problems, we refocus and find God's peace. It's his gift. If we'll come to him, be thankful and fix our thoughts on him, we can have peace. Can you have inner peace? Yes, that's the good news. And I hope you walk out thinking that. And if you don't have it, whose fault is it? It's yours. Because you're not doing the thing. You haven't put the gift together the way God wants you to. Amen? So let's pray. Father, I, I just am so thankful for this great, this incredible gift that you've given us. First, the gift of hope. The idea that no matter what's going on in our lives, we can always have hope because we serve a good God who loves us and gives us good things. Always. Even when the thing we've been given, we might think it's not a good thing. It is a good thing. And even in the midst of our trials and our sorrows and our struggles and our challenges, you are good. And you promise that if we'll, we'll give our worries, our frustrations over to you, our anxiety and our stress over to you in prayer and declare that we trust you and fix our thoughts on you instead of the problem at hand, that you will give us. The promise isn't that you'll fix the problem always. The promise is that you'll give us peace regardless of the problem. Father, we need that. I need that. There are challenges and struggles in my life and every person in this room has challenges and struggles that they're facing on a daily basis. Help us to assemble peace in our lives, to put it together piece by piece, little by little, because we need it. And when we all have inner peace, that's where world peace will come from. Father, we look forward to that day with hope and expectation. Give us your peace today and all God's people said. Amen. Amen.